This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by Ledger, makers of the best hardware security devices. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to see the full range of products and use the code EPICENTER at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we are joined by uh, Sharon Jones, who is a regulatory correspondent and currently the head of EdCap, which is the European Digital Currency and Blockchain Technology Forum. We'll be This episode is a regulatory update episode. We'll be talking about the kind of regulatory themes going on in the European Union, the United States, and the rest of the world. Before we start, let's have an introduction from Sean. Sean, a bit about your background. Oh, hi there, guys. Nice to nice to be back. It's been a long time, about a year now, I think. So uh, lots to catch up on. Uh, yes, yeah, so so I'm a regulatory compliance uh, specialist, and I've been working in the virtual currency and uh, blockchain space now for about three and a half, four years, um, seen it through the various phases. And the last year and a half, I spent a lot of my time uh, working in uh, EdCab, uh, which is a uh, public policy platform uh, based in Brussels, focused on, uh, on the uh, European Union, um, trying to help legislators and policymakers uh, understand what virtual currencies are, what uh, distributed ledger technology is. And uh, I suppose hoping that, um, and I think we're succeeding as well in getting um, uh, those policymakers and regulators to understand uh, how to approach regulation and the whole policy issues around uh, uh, around the subject. So. Um, that's what I do. And can you tell us a bit about some, some of the members of EdCab and uh, uh, yeah, who, yeah. Who, who's part of this? Well, so we, we, we'll, we'll take on anybody. Um, at the moment, we're fairly informally based, I'm pleased to say, but uh, as the activities have been growing this year, we're going to have to formalize it a bit more. But if I give you an example, um, uh, uh, we ran a... Uh, an expo inside the European Parliament building. So that was focused on the members of the European Parliament, all 751 of them and their staff and the um, uh, uh, representatives from the different uh, EU institutions. Uh, and that included uh, um, uh, a set of round tables that we had, uh, three round tables, one on uh, virtual currencies, one on blockchain, the other on regulation. Uh, we had about 70 people there representing um, all kinds of uh, traditional and new finance world. So uh, not only large banks, but also um, uh, uh, startups, new folks in the virtual currency and in the blockchain space. Um, and we also had folks from the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, OECD, uh, the Bank of International Settlement, uh, from um, academia, we had folks from Harvard, from Sorbonne, from various universities in the UK. We had folks from the European institutions such as ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority, and from the European Commission, as well as uh, MEPs and their um, assistants. So very, um, you know, very broad church um, participating in, in EdCab at the moment. And we'd like to try and keep it that way because that um, fosters a, 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 a very uh, free and frank exchange of views, which right now is is important. No, I, I definitely agree that uh, it's, it's important to have that sort of uh, representation, uh, at least at the European level. Um, now, let's, uh, let's on the topic of, of Europe, uh, since you are here uh, in a pretty, well, I guess, timely, um, it's, it's quite timely since uh, last week, uh, uh, Britons went to vote and decided that the, uh, that, uh, that there would be a Brexit. Um, I'm not sure if it's the UK or just England or, but um, can, can you 
let's not spend too much time on this, uh, but maybe tell us a bit about what impacts this might have on um, on the blockchain space in the UK and perhaps as well in Europe. Okay, so just just to clarify, what's happened is there was a referendum in the UK. So that's the whole of the UK that's made up of uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And uh, the outcome of that referendum was uh, uh, that um, I think it was 52% of the electorate, and there was a high turnout, um, uh, voted to leave the European Union. So up till now and still today, um, the United Kingdom is one of the 28 member states and one of the largest member states. Uh, it's been part of the European Union for 45 years or thereabouts, approximately 40 odd years. And uh, now it's decided or its electorate has decided that it wants to separate from the union. So um, uh, a very significant, probably one of the most significant events in, in my long 63 years. So uh, that, that, that's what happened. The outcome, or the likely impact, I should say, um, is, is probably too early to say. Um, it's a not, first of all, it's a non-binding referendum. So um, it doesn't force our legisl uh, legislators in the UK to, to press the exit button. There is an exit button uh, in the current European Union Treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon. There's a provision in Article 50 that says, you know, press this button and um, and you start a two-year process uh, to leave um, the European Union. Uh, that um, exit button hasn't been pressed yet, and um, our Prime Minister, who was uh, campaigning to uh, for, for Britain to stay in, um, has announced his resignation in the autumn, and he says that uh, he'll leave it to his successor to uh, to do whatever is necessary. So we're now in a very much a state of limbo. It's never been done before and uh, nobody quite knows what the real impact will be. It's going to be profound. It's going to have a huge impact on the economy of the United Kingdom, and it's probably going to have a knock-on impact on the economy of the whole of the EU. And in this intervening period, that's until the exit button is pressed, and then during the period of negotiation, um, that uncertainty is certainly not good for any business generally. Uh, in terms of uh, blockchain and virtual currency businesses, um, my guess is that it's going to have uh, some slightly different impacts, um, but probably um, not as profound as in other sectors of the economy. I think fintech generally will um, is is always very adept. Most startups are very good at. Um, at, at pivoting and changing and adapting and being very uh, versatile and agile. And I, I think that will mean that they'll be able to deal with this situation quite well. For technology companies, per pure technology companies, probably not going to have much impact. In fact, staying in a an exited UK, which tends to be um, uh, very supportive of innovation, of fintech generally, very supportive of, uh, of light regulation and so on. Uh, it's probably going to be a good place to stay or still to come. But for uh, businesses that are focused on payments, um, who are in the regulated space or expect to be in the regulated space, that's going to be problematic. And the reason there is that in the European Union, um, most regulated financial service providers are able to um, passport their what amounts to their license to do business. That means that they get a license effectively in one of the 28 member states, and that entitles them, um, in general terms anyway, entitles them to, to, to passport that to the other 27 member states without you know, having to get re-licensed in every one of the EU jurisdictions. So it's obviously a big advantage. A lot of companies have come to set up uh, in the UK uh, because of that passporting capability. And of course, the prospect is that that passporting facility might not exist in a couple of years' time. And that means they'll have to 
start in another EU member state. For those who aren't uh, dependent on the regulated space, um, I think probably the UK will still be a very good place to be based. We have things like uh, the uh, uh, Financial Conduct Authority Sandbox, which is very novel, um, allows small startups and challenger businesses, fintechs, to operate um, in a regulated space, but without having to uh, to apply all the regulations to try out, if you like. Um, and uh, the UK has that, has probably more advanced than anywhere else. There are a couple of other jurisdictions, Singapore, Netherlands have plans along those lines too, but the UK is, is, is already open for business. And um, so I, it, will be, it will be different for different players. Okay, and uh, you you mentioned like before the show that um, the Brexit news has kind of overshadowed some really positive news coming out of the Bank of England. Yes. Right? So yeah, let's get into that. Well, very quickly, the the governor of the Bank of England. So the Bank of England is the central bank in the United Kingdom, and uh, so it's the issuer of pounds, and it uh, its governor who's their head. Uh, that's of the UK's central bank. Uh, so anything he says carries a lot of significance. And he um, he had a speech prepared for a week ago, just over a week ago, um, uh, that he was to have delivered in the city of London, a uh, centre of, if you like, the financial um, hub of, of the country. Unfortunately, um, there was a, a political assassination in the UK, um, uh, I think it was that earlier that day or the day before, and so the speech was switched at the last minute to a tribute to the um, MP who lost her life, um, Joe Cox. But um, the speech was nevertheless published and it had some really good news, um, especially for virtual currency and blockchain businesses. Particularly, um, probably there were three things of significance, I believe. One was an announcement that um, e-money institutions and payment institutions, so these are the regulated entities that, that, that can operate uh, in the payment space, uh, so they're effectively licensed to operate in the payment space, but they're non-banks, um, would be entitled to open settlement accounts at the central bank. Now this is very important because in a, any payment system, um, to fully participate, you need to be able to settle with other payment institutions, with other banks. Um, and in the UK, um, it's uh, been limited to only those banks who provided them, availed themselves of that facility. There are only 40 of them. And of those 40, only three um, encouraged handling the settlement uh, the daily sort of settling between banks that goes on, only three of those banks acted on behalf of all the other payment institutions and smaller banks and challenger banks and so on. So small banks that have been actually very supportive of virtual currency businesses and other fintech uh, businesses have not been allowed effectively to open accounts for say Bitcoin exchanges and other virtual currency businesses and even some blockchain businesses by association um, because the three big banks were very risk averse in that space. So it basically meant we had a wonderful, uh, wonderfully encouraging uh, landscape for innovation in the UK for fintech, but those businesses couldn't get bank accounts or found it really hard to get bank accounts. And in fact, the UK was, I mean, it's difficult everywhere in the world, but it was particularly bad in the UK. And what uh, Mark Carney, the governor, uh, announced in that speech was that he would open um, open accounts at the Bank of England for the over a thousand uh, e-money and payment institutions. So that's, if you like, the non-bank payment institutions, if they wanted to apply. So that's now opened it up. It means all the the challenger banks, all of the payment institutions that were, were beholden to these three mega banks um, and their risk averse policies can now be more um, 
um, more challenging. Um, that's good news. That's really good news. Um, uh, it, I, I believe once the necessary laws have been changed, that may take some months, and of course Brexit may change the whole legislative timetable in the UK, but once that's uh, enacted and uh, um, all these thousand odd companies can, can, can do this, it will change the whole banking landscape in the UK and make it a very attractive place for Bitcoin and virtual currency businesses to be based. That sounds like really, uh, that's, that's really great news. I mean, did you, are there any other jurisdictions in the UK, in the, in the, the EU, where, uh, where uh, smaller financial institutions and payment service providers have access to the central bank directly? Actually, um, yes, it is less restrictive in some places. Um, Germany, for example, has a much more um, uh, decentralized approach to banking. There are local banks and regional banks and cooperative banks and a, a much broader network of banks. And so it, uh, small banks can participate in the settlement system um, and, and, uh, and that's then supported by uh, SEPA and other um, infrastructure makes it a lot easier. So in Germany, for example, there's a small Munich challenger bank called Fedor that's been really supportive of virtual currency businesses. Um, they've been, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they have just opened accounts um, uh, without performing all the proper due diligence, but nevertheless, they have uh, opened accounts for virtual currency businesses. Um, I think we'll see the UK um, probably leapfrog Germany in that. Um, so it's really good news. There have been some other jurisdictions where Bitcoin businesses have been able to open accounts, but um, th th this is the first big, big nation, I think, that, um, that that's going to make it easier. So I, I, I'm, I'm particularly upbeat about this. I think it's great news for the industry. There are a couple of other things that uh, Mark Carney mentioned that I'll just touch on. One was um, he announced more detailed work that's been done around the so-called digital pound, around uh, a fiat-based digital currency based around the pound. Um, the Bank of England see this as, uh, as an important part of the, the future, and uh, they've been researching this for a couple of years now. Um, it's fair to say the Fed in the States and, and the uh, European Central Bank have been doing similar work, uh, but the Bank of England was well ahead, and it's now upped its game. Um, it's now got its governor talking about it. They've recently done some work with PwC on a proof of concept around this, and uh, uh, they're really serious about uh, coming up with a, a digital pound. This could be really exciting news, and certainly a shot in the arm for the uh, for, for the industry. It's not a it's not a pure virtual currency, and certainly not a decentralized currency by by its nature. If it's issued by a central bank. But it's certainly um, good news. And the other thing is that, that Mark Carney talked about is um, the Bank of England using blockchain technology for some of its core activities. So it's not just looking at using blockchain in some of the peripheral areas, but using it in, um, in its core activities. Now, it's still early days, it's still researching this, but it's obviously got some serious use cases it's, uh, it's looking into. And the fact that it's talking, uh, talking so openly about it, that its head is talking about it, is, I think, amazingly significant. It's good news for blockchain, good news for virtual currencies, um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that, uh, that, that we should be very pleased about in this, uh, in this community. All sounds like like really big news, right? Like, so our, our listeners might want to check out our episode with David Andolfato, where he kind of explains uh, kind of two tiered structure of how of how the conventional banking system works and why a virtual currency issued by a central bank is such a big deal. Like as, as Sean said, right now only three big banks have really access to the let's say the ledger of the. Central Bank of England. Now they're extending it to 1,000, and like a central bank backed digital currency would extend it to millions of people, right? And yes, this... absolutely. Effectively, every single person who holds pounds will have a central bank settlement account because that's what it is. It, it's profound. If you think of this in sort of waves where, where it's opened up to 
to new kinds of institutions and at some point in the future a digital um, uh, fiat currency then that that well there is a population of 60 million in the UK potentially every one of them and then everybody abroad would would have a central bank account it's brilliant it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's phenomenal it's profound let's take a short break to talk about Jax Jax is a cryptocurrency wallet designed by the people at Decentral. Maybe you've been thinking of buying Ether, but haven't gotten around to it because you didn't know what wallet to use, which one is easy, which one is secure, etc. Well, there's an easy way now, and that way it's Jax. Jax easily and securely stores both Bitcoin and Ether. Not only does it store those currencies, you can convert them right in the app. So the, with built-in Shapeshift integration, you can, for instance, transfer Bitcoin into the wallet and directly convert it into Ether or vice versa. And since there's only one seed, it's easy to back up and it's easy to sync. Jax has wallets for literally every platform, every device for Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, or extension wallets for Chrome and Firefox. Jax is made by the people of Decentral and they have a proven track record of awesomeness. In 2013, they created CryptoKit. That was the very first browser extension Bitcoin wallet at the time. And the way to think about Jax is that it's CryptoKit on steroids. If there was doping controls for cryptocurrency wallets, Jax would be illegal, highly illegal. Fortunately, they're not. And the great thing too about the Decentral team is just they keep putting out new features and new features for Jax and it just keeps getting better and better. At a, at a disturbing pace, I would like to add. So go to jax.io, that's J-A-X-X dot I-O, to download your wallet and you'll understand what it's like to use a next generation cryptocurrency wallet. We would like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. From my, from my background, there, there, there's like two observations. So once, once you have a, a country like the UK issuing pounds on a blockchain, and accessible on a mobile device in the developing world in India. I, I just I just think like lots of people in the developing world are just going to switch to the pound from their uh, conventional money, and it, it it just might be a big, you know, geopolitical. It could be a big geopolitical move as well. Uh, in addition to just totally being, agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the it, it, if, if if you sort of think about this over the long term, let's say that you know the top tier currencies. Uh, uh, in the world, all start doing uh, blockchain-based, ledger technology-based uh, currencies. Then all of the you know hundred, how many, whatever, hundred, over one hundred currencies that are sort of the low-ranking currencies, they 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 cease to have uh, any any purpose in 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 the, in the real economy. And then the other thing, I guess, is uh, also once you have direct access to a central bank. Um, what role do payment service providers uh, play then? I mean, banks are still there to loan money, but if you if you have direct access to the central bank and you have a you have basically a payment system embedded onto your local currency, uh, why would you need to use PayPal? Why would you need to use a Visa? Why would you need to use any type of uh, a payment service provider at least within your own band the boundaries of your own country? But then if you can extend that outside of the country using some sort of you know interconnection like Interledger or something like that. Absolutely, it's um, it it has a uh, uh, it's going to be hugely impactful on the whole payments industry. I'm actually speaking to you today as we record this from Liverpool, and I'm attending the Emerging Payments Association um, sort of annual conference, and and, and they're running it uh, uh, some panels today. And we were we were talking about this because obviously this is this is new news, and it, it's still sinking in. So the, the challenges to the traditional uh, banking and payment system, um, uh, those sort of challenger providers are generally speaking members of the Emerging Payments Association, and now they are being challenged by what might yet come in a few years' time. So it's, it's, uh, it's enormous. Um, and it's also going to bring, potentially bring about those, the, the, that notion of um, uh, Austrian economics that's all about complementary currency, you know, complementary currencies, competing currencies, because if ordinary people anywhere in the world might be able to just hold central bank money very easily without going to, to get it exchanged or stored in a bank or whatever, but just interact with digital pounds or digital dollars or digital euros or other currencies, there will be real competition. I mean, yeah, this is this is like big news, and who knows? Maybe 
the future of our industry might just be you know writing smart contracts on the ledger operated by the bank of england for all we know and that might just be a way bigger market than we have at our hands today but let's see i'm not sure we can use the word smart contracts at the moment can we i mean it's it's, it's, it's a bit taboo right now as we record this no nah, come on it's I don't think it'll ever be taboo at a percent of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm only teasing. It's uh, we're, we're we're still reeling from what the impact of uh, of of, um, of the Dow hack and whether or not it is even um, you know as some call it a, a theft and others you know say no, just availing themselves of the contractual terms and conditions. Yeah. Oh, but let's not go in that. That's yes, another discussion for another day. So let's uh, let's go into the regulatory update. So um, let's first focus start on the European Union, and then we'll move to the United States. For the European Union, can you give us like a very short overview on how regulations are made in the European Union? What bodies do it, and what are kind of some of these things they have been up to in the past year? You can't use the word short update and charm James <laughs> in the same in the same sentence. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> um, right. Uh, there have been some some significant things, particularly in the last uh, six months, so the first uh, first half of uh, 2016. Um, the European Parliament um, started talking about virtual currencies uh, in the latter part of 2015 and decided that uh, it's uh, one of its committees, a very influential Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, should uh, undertake uh, 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 some research and come up with a report, which um, um, uh, it, it has now done. Uh, I was one of, uh, very honored to have been one of the few people asked to uh, give um, evidence and, and make an address to the Parliament uh, back in January, it's public hearing, and it published a draft report in February. Um, it went through various uh, uh, sort of stages of revision and was finally published in April. And that was then adopted by the Parliament in its um, May plenary session, the end of May. Uh, and so that is now, um, you know, that's now official. That is uh, the European Parliament, it's led the legislature's uh, report. And it it basically, it's not a long report, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's significant in a number of ways. Firstly, it started life being a virtual currencies report. And um, by the time it had worked its way through the final draft, it was about 50-50 in content between virtual currencies and blockchain, and I, uh, by which I mean the non-payment related uh, blockchain use cases. And I think that itself is quite profound because it then went on to explain that uh, although there are some public policy challenges and other challenges possibly uh, obviously around anti-money laundering and uh, uh, terrorist financing that are of concern generally, uh, especially in the wake of the um, uh, the power, horrible, uh, uh, heinous uh, attacks in Paris and um, in Brussels. Um, you know, these are obviously of concern to to politicians, and probably in that sense, rightly so. That they at least should be thinking about them, those those kind of issues. But also around prudential um, regulation and uh, and this kind of thing. So they they were looking at that the, 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 the there being you know some issues that needed addressing might need addressing, on the one hand. But on the other hand, saying that you know blockchain and distributed ledger technology was hugely powerful, um, has massive potential for uh, being transformational, and being used in ways that, at the moment, it's too soon to. To fully evaluate, in other words, um, uh, the, 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 the takeaway from the report was, um, you know, don't stifle this stuff with uh, with regulation, but um, rather allow innovation to to um, to flourish. And so it it, it proposed a, um, what it's termed as smart regulation rather than um, light regulation. Uh, and by smart regulation, it's saying um, they, the Parliament endorses the uh, European Commission, which is the, the kind of civil service, the administration of the, um, of, of, of the administrative branch of uh, the um, European Union, uh, to uh, its plan, its action plan to uh, bring in some measures around anti-money laundering that will affect 
um, virtual currency exchanges and also custodian wallet providers and leave that if you like as the extent of any regulatory measures uh, at the same time not turn a blind eye to blockchain but let it flourish but at the same time keep a watchful eye in case it becomes systemically important so what they're saying is as legislators unusually they don't want to create some new laws um, around the technology not just yet but equally they don't want to turn a blind eye and find that you know in five years time or whatever blockchains are running three quarters of the financial services world and it's become systemically important and they didn't if you like keep that under review so they've proposed a task force uh, to be set up under the European Commission uh, to watch over virtual currencies and, and blockchain and keep it under review for a changing risk profile make sure that uh, uh, that, that they don't miss a beat if, if, if that profile changes um, as it happens I don't believe that there will be a dedicated virtual currencies task force I think what will happen um, um, is that the um, the uh, Commission's task force that was already being initiated to deal with fintech generally will have its mandate amended to include virtual currencies and blockchain technology. Um, I had lunch recently with um, the uh, it happens to be the UK's commissioner who uh, European commissioner who is the commissioner for uh, financial services, financial stability, and uh, capital markets union, um, and uh, uh, he is certainly of the mind to include um, include virtual currencies in the in the fintech um, task force. However, there is an impact already on uh, from Brexit, and that is that uh, Jonathan Hill, the commissioner, has just tendered his resignation as a result of the referendum result he has been uh, obviously of one mind it doesn't mean that his successor will necessarily be of the same mind so this all might change and in fact this whole approach to regulation of virtual currencies and blockchain technology might be different in a year's time because someone who's been extremely influential if you like a kind of minister of, um, of financial services if you want to think of it like that um, is changing and he's been a very He's been very much uh, 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 someone who has supported fintech and someone who has been um, one not to support regulation just for regulation's sake. So that could all be different in a few weeks' time. Today's magic word is Brexit, B-R-E-X-I-T. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. Now, re regarding this uh, this uh, plenary sit sitting and and this task force on on distributed ledgers and virtual currencies and blockchains, it it seems sort of um, ill advised to. I mean, I I certainly wouldn't lump together uh, Bitcoin as a virtual currency and the use cases that it can be uh, that you can. You can make of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin as a store of value, Bitcoin as a, a means to notarize information using Opreturn, which is you know, something that Stratum does, uh, and, and then uh, blockchains as in terms of digital uh, di di distributed ledgers uh, with consensus. Uh, it seems that the issues that may arise around regulation for all of those different use cases of you know, blockchain technologies may be different and some of the risks also may be completely different. Do you think that it is a good idea for, um, for the EU to consider all of those technologies and all of the different use cases that you can make out of them uh, to consider those in one, in, in one body um, where, I mean, in reality, the, the use cases are completely different than the, uh, the, the outcomes all as well? Yeah. I um, actually I do think it's a good idea that it should they should all be considered together but I don't think that they should be regulated together and the reason that I think they should be considered together is that um, uh, 
it is very easy for there to be spillover from one from regulation that is designed for one particular um, for one particular use case, um, uh, especially if it's uh, if it's built up around say definitions, and then spill over into other kinds of use cases that might might still have, for example, a a token. Um, as its uh, as its fuel or as its um, uh, yeah as its fuel, so um, if if de if if poorly defined because of a lack of understanding of these non sort of Bitcoin type um, use cases, um, if 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 it's not properly understood and the definitions are poor, then you could find unintended consequences that you drag. Um, non-payment related um, uh, use cases into regulation that wasn't actually meant for them. So I think it is a good thing that the technology is reviewed as a whole and I think it, as it happens, I think the EU have approached it very well because they clearly, Parliament, uh, and I believe the Commission as well in my discussions with, with various uh, commission officials, I think it's well understood the distinction between these different um, use cases and that one rule doesn't necessarily have to apply them all and that they have to be very judicious in the way that things are defined when, when, there, is, um, when, when, when there is some regulation in the future. So I think it's right that they do look at the whole picture and understand it. Uh, and I think it's obviously right if the, their conclusion is that uh, they should regulate differently for different types of things and be very careful about how they define, um, say, what is a virtual currency. And what are some of the conclusions, if any, uh, around things like smart contracts and decentralized uh, autonomous organizations? I don't think there are any conclusions at the moment. Probably the organization who's looked most at um, smart contracts is ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority. Um, it's been following blockchain and distributed ledger technology uh, for two or three years now. It put out a call for evidence in uh, 2015 and it's just um, very recently, so this has been recorded in June, so I would guess it was probably earlier in June, put out um, a discussion document which you can get on the ESMA uh, website, ESMA, European Securities and Markets Authority, and they um, that's a, a, a very well thought through and reasoned discussion document that invites feedback, and anyone with an interest in the use of um, of uh, blockchain distributed ledger technology for uh, securities um, in uh, or any markets based activity. Um, is invited to uh, give feedback by the beginning. I think it's the 2nd of September. So there's, a, there's a couple of months to, to consider it. Definitely a recommended read. Um, so I think there's good understanding where the understanding needs to be. But in terms of if you're implying, you know, um, has much thought gone into things like the DAO and uh, the, the sort of problems, um, only to the extent that these kind of problems could arise. <laughs> um, uh, but I don't think there's been any deep, deep thought about what the implications are. Um, one thing I would say is that as a consequence of the DAO hack, a lot of securities regulators are definitely looking at this stuff far more closely. I know that the Swiss regulator is looking at it uh, because um, the Ethereum Foundation is based in Switzerland. Um, I know that uh, the SEC is uh, looking at, uh, at the implications and I think we'll see a lot more regulators um, you know, dusting off files around, uh, around smart contracts and really trying to see uh, what is a security and what isn't a security and what the implications might be. So probably over the next six to 12 months, we, we could see a lot of attention around this area. I, I hope that some people haven't found, you know, found themselves in trouble as a result of, the, um, of, of, of what's happened with this DAO hack. Uh, but I fear some are, 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 are on a very fine line, but time will tell. So uh, one question I had about the plenary sitting in the European Parliament, 
is that after the, re the report was issued by the committee on Eco committee of economic and monetary affairs i think there was a vote on whether to ado adopt this uh, report as a as a guiding document or not so in in that sort of vote do you do you feel there's a difference uh, in the approach different political parties across the european union take for this technology that's a really good question, and there wasn't. Um, there was amazing unanimity across the eight political groups that are represented in the in the European Parliament. Um, very little, um, broad, very much broad agreement, very little disagreement. There were, okay, the original draft, I think, was about eight pages, and it gave rise to 62 pages of amendments, but they were fairly trivial. In uh, There were more you know, detailed textual changes. And there were some compromises made in committee about the precise words, but there was nothing profound in that. Um, and in the debates, in the open debates in, in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, in the Internal Markets and Competition Committee, which also reviewed the report, and in the main parliamentary hearing, um, sadly, it was at 11 o'clock at night uh, with about um, very few MEPs actually in the parliament, which is a great shame didn't get a lot of time for debate. And in fact, there were more MEPs wanting to talk than there was time allotted. So it was popular, but you know, um, broadly speaking, um, not much political disagreement at all. We spent a lot of time on the EU. Uh, let's uh, now take it over to, to the Americas. Uh, it's been about a year and a half since uh, bit license was passed in, um, in New York. And since then, we haven't really, well, we haven't really talked about here on the show. Uh, can you give us an update about what uh, what has been happening there in New York? What, how, what, have, what have been the impacts uh, of bit license? Remarkably um, few applicants for a bit license. <laughs> so my understanding is that only two have been issued, and the second one was only issued um, quite recently. What has happened is that a lot of the startups have left uh, New York State. Um, it's not been a it's not been a very good environment for them, and so they've walked. They've gone. So essentially, that license, uh, that, that bit license, has pretty much just stifled all all innovations around Bitcoin uh, there there in New York. Certainly, the, the you know the small startups that are you know the lifeblood of new uh, newly in, new innovation. They, it's not been a good environment for them because it's very expensive to operate there. Right. Because you've got all of the, you know, the regulatory implications, which have huge regulatory costs, um, complexity, um, which they don't need to face in either other parts, many other parts of the United States or indeed elsewhere. So we've seen a um, number of, uh, of small businesses, startups move to other locations. And um, very few companies, but really only the, the, some of the best funded ones, able or wanting to, um, uh, to, to, to sign up to BitLicense. So um, it's had certainly more of a negative effect than a positive effect, in my personal opinion. And what are some of, well, I guess, yeah, that's, uh, you know, who, who depends on who you ask. Uh, but uh, what, are there any other states uh, in your knowledge that have, Try to pass similar uh, regulation to bit license, or perhaps uh, regulation, but uh, with a lighter touch or a different approach. And and are startups you know, going to those locations uh, as opposed to New York? Well, um, there certainly are um, other uh, states in the in, in the U.S. that have had a much more encouraging um, uh, environment for for startups. The obvious one that comes to mind is California because it's home to Silicon Valley. That's where so much uh, so much development in in blockchain has happened and it continues to happen. Um, California in 2015 tried to um, tried to to pass a, a, a much, in my opinion, a more pragmatic piece of um, legislation. Um, I think bit license uh, regulations were when they were first published around 40 something pages long and the California bill was I think around uh, six or seven pages something like that did grow a little over over time but that it was it was uh, much much more pragmatic much more limited in scope affected 
much fewer businesses as well. The, the New York regime is very broad in, in its scope and, um, uh, and the range of activities that, that are caught by it. Um, it passed the lower uh, legis legislature in California and uh, was partway through um, being debated and discussed in the upper house, so that was in the Senate, and um, then by some political maneuvering was kicked into the long grass and um, has yet to re-emerge. So they never quite made it, but um, it, it was certainly the, if, if you're gonna have a regulatory regime that was encouraging in, in, on the one hand, uh, light touch, um, pragmatic, and um, all, 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 all at the same time, then California's was certainly probably a good model, um, but it, 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 it never happened. There are others, um, but I think I think it's gone off the boil a lot in the U.S. Um, since the, a lot of the emphasis moved from Bitcoin to blockchain um, over the last 12 months. I think there's been less. It's been less urgent. Um, having said that, now that we've seen things happen in the uh, in the, in the um, in, uh, with Ethereum and, and the DAO, I rather suspect there'll be renewed interest in that area. So um, I suspect we may may see some new things starting. Yeah, I was I was just gonna I was just gonna ask you know, if 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 that was your impression that because we've sort of moved from Bitcoin to currency to now uh, much more of an emphasis on blockchain, whether that had an impact. And I mean, I I think you're right. I think that now that uh, we're seeing applications uh, emerge around smart contracts and decentralized autonomous organizations and specifically after what happened in recent weeks, uh, that uh, sort of this wave of scrutiny on, uh, on public blockchains that you know, we had back in 2013, 2014, might start to reemerge uh, now, but you know, around um, things like smart contracts and specifically Ethereum. As I say, uh, I, think, I think the emphasis is changing and we will see uh, we will see um, renewed interest uh, from, from regulators. Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, situated in the heart of Paris's startup scene, and I met with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger CEO, to talk about the Ledger Nano. The Ledger Nano is a Bitcoin hardware wallet based on a secure element. It is on a USB form factor that you plug directly inside your computer and it will manage all your private keys. The signature of transactions will be done inside the secure element, thus never revealing the private keys to the host computer. It is compatible with our own Ledger Wallet Chrome app, which you can also use for multi-signature with Copay or CoinKite, and a large range of third-party applications such as Mycelium, Electrum, GreenBits, Green Address, and so on. The Nano also exists as a cool bracelet wearable, so you can always wear proudly your Bitcoins on your wrist. The Ledger Nano is an easy to use hardware storage option, which doesn't compromise on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER Bitcoin. Like you, you mentioned that uh, the Swiss regulators were looking at specifically the, the DAO episode and uh, perhaps the SEC would also investigate into it. Are you aware like what, what specifically what features of the DAO they would be investigating? Like for example, like one aspect of the DAO that, that I, 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 I have my doubts about is the way in which uh, investments were solicited, like on, on Facebook, uh, targeted at all kinds of people, maybe even young people without maybe even proper disclaimers as to what, what, what it was. And so you could have investigations directed on the crowdfunding side. You could have it. Yeah, more. I guess it's exactly that. Um, that, that they'll be looking to see if, if, if this was a, an unregulated um, and therefore unauthorized security. Um, and if it was, um, in their opinion, then, then, then we're likely to see some action taken. I think it's very early days, but uh, you know, uh, people have potentially lost money, 
and um, regulators get very interested uh, when something in their space means that um, the people they're supposed to be protecting or whose interests they're supposed to be protecting, um, you know, so if citizens lose uh, lose money on investments, um, then they 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 get concerned. So yeah. early days, but yeah. I mean the other the other aspect obviously that's that's now interesting is, uh, like, does the DAO form give any protection any protection against personal liability for the people who are involved in it, right? So. Like we see, like in this episode, you have uh, the authors of the code, the curators of the DAO, uh, the people that solicited these investments, you know, put the ads on Facebook and Slack and etc. So we, they're all publicly known. And do they get any, any pers- like any protection against personal liability from, from this whole episode? Should things come to that level? No. No, the whole point about... Uh... A DAO um, and any of these virtual organizations, if one wants to call them that, um, is that they haven't got the benefit of uh, of, of a jurisdiction's um, limited liability uh, corporation type um, structure, uh, and as such, they are unassociated. Uh, sorry, um, unlimited uh, associations. So. Um, groups of people like a partnership and uh, essentially um, the partners, the members of the association are all jointly and severally liable in most in most jurisdictions. Uh, that's going to be very interesting as we may see a number of lawsuits around the DAO. You know, um, it's all very well that this um, brave new world of DAOs and DACs um, um, is uh, not encumbered with the structures of the state and uh, these wonderful protections of, uh, of, 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 of limited liability and so on, so long as everybody's making money. When folks start losing money, then you start to find out that actually it really does matter. and. Um, but there will certainly be, I think, some folks who will who will take out lawsuits, and um, potentially, um, you know, for the full limit of their uh, their losses. Um, we shall, you know, these are early days, but this is of some obvious concern. Probably shows that in the long run, pure pure DAOs and DACs won't won't be the be all and end all uh, that what we'll need probably is some kind of hybrid um, that's my personal opinion as to what's likely to happen over the next few years but these these are very very early days um, it's interesting that the main proponents see this as something that's above nation state laws and something that's very separate and 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 then um, uh, they'll be looking to the, those very self same laws to uh, to cover their their, their financial losses um, we shall see i don't know yeah. early days i mean like what i've kind of become aware of is that it is certainly possible to merge the the dao structure with a traditional corporate structure like the example I have come across uh, in Switzerland is um, like one of one of my associates was trying to kind of create a company and he wanted to build a DAO and he consulted with multiple lawyers and what they said is you could have a traditional Swiss corporate structure the AG and maintain all of your shares on the Ethereum blockchain and enter into smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain as long as you comply with the incorporation requirements of the AG in Switzerland. So you could ha- have basically defense against personal liability as well as benefit from whatever you want to benefit from on the on the Ethereum blockchain. So these kinds of structures are definitely possible, right? I, uh, I, I believe so, yes. I, I think that kind of hybrid is a much more practical way of, of, uh, of operating. So um, 
the idea of a distributed autonomous corporation, I think, is uh, is is unlikely really to take hold. Um, a traditional corporation that where the shareholders exercise their rights through uh, a DAO type mechanism and where the operation of certain things in a company happens within um, a consensus uh, system. I think those are feasible. They're not without challenges though. Uh, for example, um, the moment you have a traditional uh, uh, RG is Kien uh, Gesellschaft, that's a company with limited liability, and the, the, the similar structures in most jurisdictions. Um, the, the, the moment you have an entity like that, you have to have people who are responsible. So typically they're directors. And those directors have, have duties to the shareholders as a whole and, uh, and responsibilities. Now, that, that, that will be quite interesting because th then you, you say, well, you know, someone is accountable for the actions of this entity. If the actions are automated through smart contracts um, that are not directly controlled by those directors, how can they be fully responsible? And so there are a lot of areas of challenge. But if a DAO was properly constructed with, I don't know, forms of kill switches and overrides that allowed directors to fulfill their legal obligations under the law, um, then I think it would, you know, it is possible. And that's why I say I think in the future the pragmatic approach is probably going to be a hybrid. I mean, yeah, like, like I think, I think this kind of conclusion is something that. Um... Let's say the crypto anarchist in me doesn't like that much, <laughs> but but on the on the other side, like what this DAO episode has clearly shown to me is, uh, it has raised this question in my head that if I have like a pure organization just based on code on Ethereum, and something like this episode happens, which could right, our technology is very mature, even with good intentions, it could happen, then uh, and I'm involved with an entity like that then the then the problem is that i might be liable in a jurisdiction in which i have never set foot so let's say let's say let's say you know i am i'm the creator of a purely code based dao and some it goes belly up some some person in finland let's say ends up losing a hundred thousand dollars now that guy could sue me under finnish local law and then I would be liable inside Finland, even though I have probably never stepped foot inside it. And I could be liable in so many jurisdictions by so many local standards that it might be just impossible for me to uh, to survive if, if a tragedy like that happens, right? Well, we want this brave new borderless world that is facilitated by, um, by crypto um, that transcends... Um, uh, traditional jurisdictional boundaries, um, but in the real world, those borders exist, those jurisdictions are, exist, and laws exist within those jurisdictions. And it's amazing, you know, people and businesses are still subject to those laws. Um, the place you really don't want to uh, uh, to mess people around in is uh, is the USA, which is why even in the, in, the, in the, because the laws are very very much. Um, uh, um, wider in scope and also their jurisdictional reach. So um, uh, you often, in, particularly in the, in the financial space, um, laws are designed or written in ways that uh, they don't only affect the people who are in the US. And so even in the traditional um, financial services world, you often see disclaimers that say, you know, uh, this is not for advertising in the United States, or this it, it, uh, that that check your IP when you connect to a website. And say sorry, you can't access the information about it, this investment because you're uh, you know in the USA, or, or or you have to you know tick a box and confirm that you're in no way connected with the USA and you're not a US citizen. Those kind of things before you can get into the detail of the investment. Um, uh, so definitely avoid any uh, anything in the U.S. because they have um, 
uh, an endless supply of orange jumpsuits and some very wide um, legislation, wide reaching. So before we wrap up here, let's, uh, let's sort of come back full circle and, and perhaps talk about some of the jurisdictions uh, that uh, are more, more enlightened than others uh, that aren't ready to put you in an, yeah, an orange jumpsuit if you uh, do something that's seemingly, you know, doesn't warrant that type of uh, punishment. Uh, are there any jurisdictions right now in the EU or outside of the EU that uh, you feel are particularly open and uh, where they're thinking about blockchain technologies and uh, whether they be public or, or permissioned, uh, where they're thinking around uh, the evolutions of, of those technologies are, are, are more advanced than others? Or um, there probably advanced. are. The, yes, I, th I think there probably are. I don't necessarily think that um, enlightened um, should, be, should, should be thought to mean um, where there's little or no regulation uh, because um, there are lots of places where there's little or no regulation around blockchain and virtual currencies, but that doesn't mean that they want to encourage it. So places that are encouraging of, um, of, of innovation and giving a good, um, they may have, for example, some light touch regulation or they might be planning some, but where they're doing so in order to foster innovation, give it some stability and credibility. Um, they would include places like the Isle of Man, uh, which is one of the first jurisdictions. It's a small jurisdiction, but um, um, actually has been very successful in encouraging new technology and e-gaming and um, uh, uh, space and, and biopharma and so on. So um, they're definitely very encouraging of crypto. Um, in the more traditional world, well, the UK itself has been very encouraging. It's, it's been talking at the highest levels of government uh, about encouraging it had lots of uh, reports and high level ministerial backing and money that's um, um, that's been poured into it uh, 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 government money that's been poured into say research uh, in the space where they've had um, uh, you know a, a positive statements uh, around regulation so giving clarity as to um, regulation without necessarily introducing um, uh, any, um, so UK has definitely been one of those places, and I guess in a in a in a post EU world that uh, that might well be accelerated. Outside uh, there, Singapore has been very encouraging, um, and uh, I, I uh, and Australia. Um, now I'm not saying that's an exhaustive list, but those are definitely jurisdictions that would uh, would like to see. Um, uh, 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 virtual currencies and blockchain distributed ledger technologies prosper and flourish. I, I definitely agree that having a light touch regulation, or at least it give, gives the technology some uh, some means to be recognized by the state, but also by large companies that may want to invest in, in building on these technologies. And I mean, for for instance, uh, uh, I mean, you mentioned the UK, Isle of Man, etc. You know, those are I think we all agree are. Um, pretty, um, uh, you know, are, are, are places that foster innovation around blockchain. Uh, here in France, we've seen recently the Macron of the uh, non government and specifically uh, the uh, economy minister uh, uh, encouraged the use of blockchains um, for the issuance of debt obligations for uh, uh, equity crowd lending. Um, now that so it, it is encouraging, but it's still um, uh, how do I say? I mean, this so uh, news like this is sometimes you know, can be interpreted in different ways because uh, well, for instance, they had to translate blockchain to like some French equivalent of blockchain because in French law you have to have everything in French and proper French, and so uh, the 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 translation of blockchain is like this you know, six word term that you know could be interpreted as so many other things and do you do we think it's a bitcoin blockchain like a public blockchain or do we think it's uh, you know a distributed ledger like more like a permission blockchain so uh it it, it it does definitely have some advantages and that it gives the, the technology some legitimacy but in the, on the other hand it can be sometimes a little frustrating reading through some of this um some of these opinions uh, and not really knowing what it is that you know it's very subject to interpretation and it's mostly i think in my opinion because of a lack of understanding of the technology by these people 
And I think that highlights another point, which is that it takes time for the world to catch up. So, you know, we, we, the three of us have been immersed in blockchain for a number of years. We, we're, we're the pioneers, um, if you like. But the mainstream world takes time to catch up. And um, one has to factor in that it will take time for the rest of the world to catch up and to understand this uh, this stuff and to be able to um, see what its place is in the world and what actually what what benefits there are to understand better the the challenges and the risks but also to see those benefits and opportunities and that takes time so I know we would all like it to have happened already and we should all be using Bitcoin by now in our daily lives and um, the whole world should be run on blockchains and uh, the referendum in the UK should have been uh, carried out on a blockchain and and so on and so forth we would have all loved that but realistically we have to have a, a more a more well yes a, a, a longer time frame in mind so five ten fifteen years is a is a time frame for the rest of the world to catch up I certainly hope it doesn't take that long, but uh, let's let's say that's a good note to end on. To be patient, we have to be patient in this space. Like, well, you so see, I'm old. I, I, that's all I do is just wait for <laughs> for, for God's waiting room. There. <laughs> uh, well, that was, it was great to have you on again, Sean. Um, thank you for coming on, and and hopefully we'll have you on again soon, and maybe maybe not, maybe not in a year. Uh, we'll, we'll hope that there's some interesting regulatory updates that uh, that we can. Um, pool your, your, your knowledge and intelligence of the space and, and have you come back on the show at that point. Well, it's always my pleasure. I love, I love doing these shows with you guys and I look forward to, uh, to many more of them, even when you have to wheel me in on my, uh, in my, in my wheelchair. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and is there anything you want to add? Any? Well, if folks want to know a little bit more about uh, what's happening in the EU, they can go to uh, the EdCab website edcab.eu that's e d c a b.eu and there's loads of information there about what's uh, what's happening in the European Union and uh, sort of more general commentary else on, on the regulated space outside of the EU you can always look at my personal um, uh, my personal website uh, coinsult c o i n s u l t coinsult.eu so loads of information and i'm sure you guys will have some uh, some show notes as well uh, yeah, we will we'll add also those things to the show notes uh, so thanks again and thanks to you to our listeners for tuning in we are part of the LTB network you can find lots of great shows on Bitcoin blockchain distributed ledger technologies decentralized all kinds of stuff at liststockbitcoin.com uh, you can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash epicenter BTC you can also download the show on iTunes SoundCloud or whatever podcast app you choose to use and of course uh, if you're interested in uh, tipping us you can do that the link will be in the show description and finally if you would like a t-shirt such as this one uh, you can leave us a, a review on itunes and just send us an email at show at episode bitcoin.com to let us know and we'll send you a t-shirt and some stickers so thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week